Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our Sunday devotional worship today. And I pray that as the Lord has started blessing us from the beginning of this service, His blessing will continue and multiply in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Now we come to the time of looking at the word together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for this time. Thank you for a heart that worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you, Lord, because you desire our worship, you delight in our worship, and you accept our worship. And we pray, Lord, as we come to hear your word now, you grant us listening ears, attentive ears, circumcised ears, obedient ears, that will take to your word and store your word in our hearts and your word will be profitable in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As already you know, we've been going through a series of uh, studies in the word of God, directly from Christ, the head of the church. The Lord has found it necessary to speak to the church from his own heart, pouring out his heart to the church. Now we're in church number five. Already he has spoken to the church in Ephesus and the church in Pagamos, the church in Tatira as well as the church in Smyrna. Now he's bringing his message to us from the church or through the church in Sardis. We're looking at chapter 3 today of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1 all through to verse 6. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, this six says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Then in verse 2 he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. In verse 3 he says, Remember therefore, how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In verse 4 it says, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In verse 5, it says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He now concludes in verse 6, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That's a message he sent to the church in Sardis. And then he tells us at the conclusion of that message in this verse 6. He says he was not talking only to the church in Sardis, but he's talking to the whole church, all the churches. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, unto the churches of that first century, unto all the churches of every generation, unto all the churches in this generation, unto all the churches at the time of his coming again. He says, I come, I come suddenly, and I come unexpectedly, and I'm going to come assuredly. And he says, I will come on thee. I will come to thee. And I will come at a time you are not expecting. 
and at such a time like that when we're waiting for the coming of the lord and we know he can come any moment any time from now to make the dead in christ those who have died in christ to rise up and those of us who are still alive to take us away to catch us away in the rapture and take us to heaven at such a time like this he wants us to have the appropriate attitude to the word of God as we're hearing. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, the churches of the last days. As we look at this message, we're titling the message, Awakening Dead Members in a Dying Church. Awakening Dead Members in a Dying Church. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, recognizing and awakening spiritually dead souls. Number two, remembering and applying the Savior's divine specific. That word specific there is a word that is used for a prescription in medicine. In medicine, when you prescribe, you can call it prescription after you have diagnosed the problem, or you can call it specific. And the divine specific, the divine medicine the Lord is given, it says what to remember and what to apply the Savior's divine specific. Point number three, refining and abiding with sanctified diligent saints. We come to point number one now, and we're reading from Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, and unto the whole church in Sardis write. You see, at that time, they had just one church in every city. Even if they had branches, like we have, we have branches there, branches there, branches there in one city, and we have districts and we have groups, all those groups together, all those districts together, the Lord addressed them as one church because he sees the unity of the church. He sees the fellowship of the church. He sees the togetherness of the church. Even though we're in different places because of uh, maybe having a church building that will contain everyone, he still sees the church just as one church and he writes to the leader, he writes to the minister, and he writes to the pastor of that one church in Sardis, like he's writing to our church. And he looks at us as one church, even though we might even be in different cities, he says to the angel, to the leader, to the minister, and to the pastor, to the shepherd of the church, here is what I'm writing. He says these things, says he that has the seven spirits of God. You understand he's talking about the seven aspects of the spirit of god and the seven descriptions of the same spirit of god even those of us who are human beings you sometimes describe us for example you take a man you say is a man you take that same man and you say is a professional is an engineer that same man you say he is a husband that same man you say he is a father that same man you say he is a neighbor is talking about the same personality divine personality and he's talking about the fullness of that spirit he's talking about the perfection of that spirit he's talking about the completeness of that spirit and he says christ has the seven spirits of god the fullness of the spirit of god and the seven stars the stars stand for the ministers the angels of the churches and it says i know thy words that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead as we look at this section recognizing and awakening spiritually dead souls there are three things we're looking at here number one the deception in spiritual deadness. When there's spiritual deadness and somebody does not have uh, the spirit of God or the life of Christ, and that spiritual deadness is going to show forth in that person's life 
there's deception. The fellow might think is alive, very much alive, and yet that fellow is dead. That's the deception there. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Number two is the description of the spiritually dead. When it says, thou hast a name that thou livest, and you're deceiving yourself that you're alive, but you are dead, what's the description? What makes us understand how that dead soul is who is spiritually dead? Number two, the description of the spiritually dead. Number three, we cannot just think about the death without talking about the deliverer. The one who delivers us, our Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, that is the reason why he sent the message, so that those who are dead will come alive. He's talking now, number three, will be the deliverer from, number one, the spiritual death. He delivers us. Number two, the deliverer from the second death. Number three is the deliverer from eternal death. Eternal death, total separation from God. He delivers us. And Jesus Christ is presented as the deliverer from all kinds of death, from the second death. Let's come to number one. Number one is the deception. The deception in spiritual deadness. And look at the latter part of that verse one. In Revelation chapter three, verse one, it says, Thou hast a name that thou livest, neighbors look at you and they think you are alive and uh, other religious people look at you and they think you are alive and even you yourself, you commend yourself, you project yourself as if you are alive. You know why? There are people that um, they uh, compare spirituality with um, religiosity because they're religious, they think That's, that means they're alive. Because they make a profession, they seek their life. Because they can say, uh, you know, we know the songs we sing and we read the Bible. We even pray and God answers our prayer. They deceive themselves because they seek their life when they are dead. I want you to look at Romans chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 6. In Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 6, you'll see the deception here and you'll see what the man is saying about himself, what the woman is saying about himself, what the religious is saying about himself. It says in Romans chapter 8 verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. He comes to church, to be carnally minded is death. He can read the Bible, to be carnally minded is death. He prays, and whenever he prays, he might pray for healing and pray for miracle, and by the mercy of God, he gets healing. He seeks because of that, I'm alive, and yet he is carnally minded. To be carnally minded is death. Or to be spiritually minded when a change happens, when a change takes place, when there is a conversion and the carnal mind is turned, a change is transformed to a spiritual mind. It says to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And you understand the carnal mind somebody who hates the word of god he only wants bread he only wants water he only wants god to butter his bread and sugar his tea he only wants material things he only wants god to do everything he's asking god but he hates the word of god he hates the commandments of god to be carnally minded is dead because the carnal mind is at enmity with god is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of God. It's not submissive to the law of God. It's not obedient to the law of God. It's not even desiring the law of God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. It cannot be because a such is the heart that is contrary to the will of God and the word of God. That's why it says in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, So then, they that are in the flesh, they love the works of the flesh. 
they perpetrate the works of the flesh, they do the works of the flesh, they enjoy the works of the flesh, all those works of the flesh that will debar a person from entering into the kingdom of God. That's what they practice and that's what they delight in. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But they deceive themselves. Look at chapter 7 of Romans. Romans chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, For I was alive without the law once. You know what that is saying? It's saying when I live or when you live, when anyone lives without thinking of the law of God. And he lives as if there's no law. He lives as if there's no scripture. He lives as if there's no commandment of God. And therefore he is alive. He goes here and there and he's free. He makes himself free to do whatever because he acts in a lawless manner. He thinks there's no law of God. He thinks there's no God that gives us any law. I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When the commandment came and God says, I am still God, I change not. When the commandment came and God says, I love righteousness, I love holiness. When the commandment came and he says, if you are going to please me, thou shalt not do this. You will not go that direction. And when I heard that, sin revived. The sin was there, but it appeared dormant. It appeared unrecognized. But now as the law of God came, sin revived and I died. In verse 10, it says in verse 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life, the commandment which was ordained to eternal life, abundant life, spiritual life, I found to be unto death. It says in verse 11, in verse 11, it says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. The deception in spiritual deadness deceived me, and by it slew me. It tells us in James chapter 2, Reading from verse 17, the deception of those who think they have faith, they think they have the life of God, and they think they have this and that, but they do not have the action, the character, the comportment, the lifestyle of a real believer that has faith in God. That's the deception. Even so faith in James chapter 2 verse 17. Even so faith, you claim to have faith. Even so faith, you say I'm a faith man, I'm a faith woman. Even so faith, if it has not works, if it's only the talk of the mouth, superficial talk. If it's only the talk of the mouth, empty profession. If it has not works, it's dead being alone. Look at verse 20 there. It says in verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? That faith without walking in the line of the word of God, will thou know, O vain man, that that is dead? Will thou know that faith, if it has not works, is dead? Faith without works is dead. In verse, uh, in verse uh, 26, in verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead. Hold on for a moment. The people of those days, both in the Old Testament, until the New Testament, there was a way they could embalm a dead body and preserve that dead body. And the dead body, when you look at that body, it will look as if that dead body was still alive. And so, in those days, they could preserve, you'll be surprised, the body for a hundred years. In fact, we've read in history of dead bodies that were preserved for more than a thousand years. And the apostle is making an illustration from that. And he's saying, for as the body without the spirit is dead, even though they might preserve it, and it looks to an ordinary person as a body that is alive, yet it is dead. So faith without works is dead also. 
faith without works is dead also. I want you to look at Titus chapter 1 verse 16. Titus chapter 1 verse 16. For they profess that they know God. That's their deception. They deceive themselves and they think they know God. But in works they deny him. They say they have faith, they profess they have faith, but they don't have the corresponding works and the actions. It says, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and to every good work reprobate. Now we've seen uh, the deception of spiritual deadness. Let's come to the second section now. It's the description of the spiritually dead. The description of the spiritually dead. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Uh, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Remember this is written to our church. This is written to every church. He that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto all the churches. These six say is he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works you may not even know I know thy works your neighbors may not know I know thy works and religious people around you may not know about your deadness about your spiritual death it says but I know I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest Thou hast a name that thou livest. Don't touch that. Hear the word of God. See what the Lord is saying. Allow God to describe the stage of the spiritually dead to you. And then you compare your spiritual life, your profession, your witness, your testimony with what the Lord is saying. He says, Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And look at Ephesians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 1. The description from the word of God. The description from the spirit of God. The description from the scriptures about the spiritually dead. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It says, And you are sick wicked who are dead in trespasses and sins. Who are dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, there are times, uh, I don't know whether you uh, had this experience before. You go to um, a medical uh, person and uh, he wants to either inject you or he wants to draw the blood out to test the blood. But they deaden the place so that you will not feel the pinch and you will not feel the pricking of the pain. And as uh, they use that solution to uh, deaden that place, you'll not feel anything at all. Even though they put a pin there, it's saying the same thing. There are people who are dead. Their consciences are deadened. And their hearts are deadened. Their spirits are deadened. And their, the inner man in them is deadened. And even though there are trespasses, even though there are sins, they don't feel anything. The conscience does not feel anything. The heart does not feel anything. The mind does not feel anything. You know why? Because the conscience has been deadened. Because the heart has been deadened by trespasses and sins. And the Spirit of God uh, does not even penetrate to jolt them and to uh, make them prick and to make them feel the sense or the sensation of the transgression of the trespass and of the sins. They are dead in sins and trespasses. Let me ask you, do you commit sin without feeling guilty? you tell lies without feeling any pinching? And do you steal without feeling any condemnation? Do you commit adultery, fornication without even feeling anything at all? Are you so dead that when you do an evil sin, when you get angry, when you fight, you don't feel any guilt at all? And you say, I don't feel any guilt. I feel all right. You know why? Because you are dead in trespasses and sins. He tells us in verse 2. In verse 2, he says, we're in, in time past before our conversion. We're in a time past before we had salvation. We're in a time past before the Spirit of God quickened us. We're in a time past. He walked according to the cause of this world. 
That's why some people are dead spiritually. They don't know. They say so and so is doing it according to the cause of this world. Such and such is doing it according to the cause of this world. They say that's what everybody does. And because they walk like everybody else, they think like everybody else, they act like everybody else, and they conduct their lives like everybody else according to the cause of this world, they think it's all right. They think the majority carries the vote. The majority is right. And since I'm acting and since I'm living like everybody does, I must be all right. That's the description of the spiritually dead. And it says, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. The devil controls them. And the devil as he controls them and he makes them do the evil they ought not to do. He also stops the mouth of their conscience. He muscles the mouth of their conscience that their conscience cannot say anything about what they're doing. And it says it's the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience in the children of disobedience you see the language of scripture there is making the disobedience as their parent disobedience as their master disobedience as the authority in their lives it says these are children whose appearance that is uh, emotionally and psychologically and spiritually the parent is disobedience they are walking uh, in the way of the world as the children of disobedience and then he tells us in verse 3 it says in verse 3 and among whom also we all urge those of us who are converted were no more like that that's why it's uh, using past tense we all urge our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh remember this is describing those who are spiritually dead fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others why so why is that so look at verse 12 it says in verse 12 that at that time, this time we're describing before conversion. This time we're describing before salvation. This time we're looking at before a person meets the Lord and before he repents and before he is converted, that at that time you were without Christ. Christ gives life. Christ is the Savior. Christ is the one that sets us free. And if you are without Christ, you're spiritually dead. You do not have the life of God without Christ. It says, you are without Christ, being aliens, strangers, being aliens, foreigners, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, no hope of heaven having no hope, no hope of ever getting better, having no hope, no hope of turning over and becoming transformed because it is only Christ that gives us that hope. It is faith in Christ, abiding, active, dynamic faith in Christ that gives us that hope, having no hope and without God in the world, without God in the world it tells us in uh, first john chapter 5 reading from verse 11 first john chapter 5 from verse 11 and this is the record that god has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son you understand without christ without god we don't have spiritual life we don't have eternal life and it says those who are dead in sins and trespasses in this world they are without god in this world they are without christ if they are without christ they're without life they're without eternal life they're without spiritual life and it says this is the record that god has given to us eternal life and this life is in his son look at verse 12 in verse 12 it says he that has the Son has life. He that has received the Son has life. He who believes in the Son of God has life. He who embraces the Son has life. 
And he that has not the Son of God has not life. That's the spiritually dead man, the spiritually dead woman, the spiritually dead boy, the spiritually dead girl. He says, he that has not the Son of God, he has not believed on the Son of God. He has not received the Son of God. He has not gotten that salvation that comes from Christ and comes through Christ. He that has not the Son of God has not life. And look at Jude chapter 1. We're reading from verse 12. Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 12, is talking about the people who just, you know, come to church and they feast with us and they fellowship with us and they sing with us and they worship with us. But they do not have the life of Christ in them. And the word of God describes them that they're spiritually dead. They may have a name that they live, but they are dead. It says in Jude chapter 1 verse 12, These are spots in your feast of charity. In your fellowship of charity, when they feast with you, they fellowship with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither is, without fruit, twice dead, doubly dead. You know what that means? When they were in the world, they were dead, totally dead spiritually dead. Now they come to church and they feast with the people of God and they fellowship with the people of God. And you will seek that they'll become better. You'll seek they'll be transformed. But now they're even more dead than when they were in the world. Twice dead. Maybe they came to uh, say that they received Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And then they came to life, uh, supposedly, but now they're backsliding and they're dead again. They're twice dead. They're doubly dead. They're seriously dead. They're completely dead. There's no breath of life and there's no life of Christ in them at all. Twice dead, plucked up by the rules. How do you know such people? Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, raging waves of the sea. They rage, they foam, they're furious, they're angry, they wear their temper on their sleeves. You know them anywhere they are. The noise of fighting, the noise of raging, you can tell. And they feel no shame. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, they don't stay at home. They don't stay where they ought to stay. They don't stay in the place of work where they ought to be. And they don't stay at school where they ought to be. They are wandering here and there. They wander to this gang and wander to this other gang. And they wander everywhere. They are wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, you look at their attitude and their character. We're looking at verse 15. In verse 15, talking about their character it says God is going to come Christ is going to come to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them this one's ungodly because they're spiritually dead ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds their character is ungodly their actions are ungodly, their deeds ungodly, and all the things, their projects, they are ungodly, which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, they can talk. All their hard speeches, and their speeches, whether they are talking to a child, or they are talking to um, their wives, or they are talking to their husband, hard speeches, or they are even talking to God, which ungodly sinners, ungodly sinners, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And look at verse 16, it describes them, those who are spiritually dead, these are murmurers. Nothing pleases them. They might even give them something free. They are not paying anything for that sin. 
and still the momo is this all i'm going to have you can give them chance opportunity property we can give them anything they always momo like the children of israel they didn't pay anything for the manna coming from heaven every day and yet they murmured and they complained and they grumbled these are murmurers and complainers walking after their own laws and their mouth speaketh great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage but why are we seeing all these why did christ reveal all this to the church unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things says he that has the seven spirits of god and the seven stars i know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead why was he revealing that because he is the deliverer and he wants to deliver everyone from that spiritual death. He wants to deliver everyone from that sinful death. He wants to deliver everyone from that second death. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 14. He is our deliverer because he has died for us and because he tasted death for every man. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, Christ the Savior, he also himself, Christ who suffered for you, he also himself, Christ our sin bearer, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, his death on the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them look at verse 15 in verse 15 it says and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage we were in bondage but now christ has come and as he comes he delivers us from that death and he shows us the way of salvation in luke chapter 1 verse 79 luke chapter 1 we're reading from verse 79 it's talking about the deliverer and it says to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to give them light those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet in the path in the way of peace that's what he does but you know we have a part to play in ephesians chapter 5 verse 14 ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 14 it says wherefore he says awake thou that sleepest awake thou that is stumbling awake those who are spiritually dead and arise from the dead arise from the dead is calling us to repentance is calling us to come into the lord and then holding on to the lord and believing in the lord arise from the dead and christ shall give thee light and christ shall give thee life and christ shall give thee eternal life come to christ and it will give you eternal life and as you come to christ you abide in christ and remain in christ so that the second death, the final death, will not catch up on you. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Arise from the dead and let Christ give you life and give you light. It says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death that's what the lord is calling us to we're seeing point number one recognizing and awakening spiritually dead souls now we come to point number two Point number two, remembering and applying the Savior's divine specific. What's the Lord telling us? And how are we to have that life and keep that life, hold on to that life until he comes? Here is what he has told us. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Please open your Bible. Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at verses 2 and 3. It says, be watchful. 
That's the directive he has given us. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. And look at uh, by verse 3 there. In verse 3 it says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief suddenly and quickly unexpectedly and thou shalt not know the hour I will come upon thee. Here is what the Lord is telling us. Yeah, it might say the things were supposed to you so that there will be no confusion. Number one, it says, be watchful. Be watchful. Number one is talking about personal watchfulness. Personal watchfulness. Number two is talking about prioritized watchfulness. You make this kind of watchfulness a priority, prioritized watchfulness and then you make this perpetual watchfulness the watchfulness of yesterday is not enough for today and the one of today is not enough for tomorrow perpetual watchfulness look at first peter chapter 4 verse 7 in first peter chapter 4 verse 7 but the end of all things is at hand be ye therefore be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer, prayerful watchfulness. Remember, this is personal. You have to watch. You have salvation, you have to watch. You have the life of Christ, you have to watch over that. And you have the witness in you that by the grace of God, you are alive. Or maybe you are not as alive as you ought to be. You want to take this personally and you want to find out who am I? How am I in the sight of the Lord and his personal watchfulness? I spoke about prioritized watchfulness. You know what that means? Let's say, for example, you think about your body and you think about your clothing and you think about the tie we wear and you think about the shoes. When we talk about prioritized watchfulness, you're not going to watch over a pair of shoes like you watch over the condition of your heart because at the very center of your life you're not going to watch over a tie like you watch over your eyes your eyeballs that make you to see you know that your heart is more important than the shoe you know that your eyes are more important than the tie. You know that your body is more important than any piece of cloth. And therefore, you give priority. You are not watching over something negligible, something dispensable, something redundant, while you are not watching over the very center of your life and your readiness for the coming of the Lord. There is personal watchfulness, there is prioritized watchfulness, and the devil is not sleeping. The devil is not on vacation. That's why the watchfulness is perpetual every time. Personal watchfulness, prioritized watchfulness, and perpetual watchfulness. It tells us in um, First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it says in First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. In verse 9, it says, whom receives steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Number two, what the Lord Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 verse 2, he says, and strengthen the things that remain. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Strengthen the things that remain. How do we strengthen the things that remain? In Psalm 27, reading from verse 14. Psalm 27, reading from verse 14, it says, Wait on the Lord. There are times you'll find yourself weak. 
There are times you find yourself at the edge, at the brink of life. You're still alive, but almost dying. Now, and you need to wait. You need to withdraw from the public. You need to withdraw from society. You need to withdraw from the world and wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The Lord is coming. And because the Lord is coming, and you find that you are not fully ready, it says, wait on the Lord. I say, wait on the Lord. It says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 31, it says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's how you strengthen the things that remain. Look at your life. The things that remain in your personal life, the things that remain in your family, the things that remain in your ministry and if you're a pastor, the things that remain, the people that remain in the church that you're overseeing. It says they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary if you're running the race that is set before you but you're always getting tired, always getting discouraged, always getting downtrodden, always feeling can I continue? Uh, am I going to stop halfway in my journey? It says when you wait upon the Lord, he'll strengthen you and it says you'll mount up with wings as eagles. You will run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. And then the Lord Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 2, he tells us number 3 of what to do. He says be watchful, number 1, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. That's number two. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us, and this is not something another person can do for you. He wants us to so walk before the Lord that whatever is imperfect, whatever is impure, whatever is not perfectly all right, we correct things. And he says we should walk before him and be perfect. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. It says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, he had known the Lord at the age of 75, 90 years old and nine. This is uh, 24 years after the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk thou before me and be thou perfect. What do you think? If Abraham, if Abraham will reply God and say, God, I'm not an angel, I'm just a human being. What you are telling me, I cannot do. I cannot be perfect because, you know, I'm a descendant of Adam. That will not please the Lord. I give of the Lord. And there are people like that. There are even theologians. And they say, nobody can be perfect. Nobody can be sinless. Nobody can be spotless. And therefore, whatever sin, whatever transgression, whatever iniquity you have, just carry on. God understands. God understands that you disregard him, that you dishonor him, that you disobey him. God understands that you uh, condemn what he has said and you walk contrary to him and you contradict him. No, he doesn't understand that. He told Abraham and he's telling you and telling me, he says, I've not found your work perfect before me. Rise up and perfect what is lacking. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I'm sure you've had that before, my brother, my sister. I'm sure you've had that before. What effort have you made? What prayer have you prayed? What change have you made? What utterance have you made before God? How careful and watchful have you been since you heard the word of God unto you that says, I am the almighty God walk before me and be thou perfect. You're satisfied with walking before men and walking before your neighbors and walking before those who are singing your praise. Whatever you do, they always say you are all right and they're singing your praise. You are walking before them and you are imperfect. God says, forget about society, forget about them. I am the almighty God 
walk before me and be thou perfect. It tells us now, number four, as you come to in Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. What's that telling us? It's referring us back to the past. How thou hast received and heard. You see, there are messages of uh, the present day. They are not like we heard. They are not like we received. There are messages of the modern time. There are messages of the dead, dying church. There are messages of just positive thinking, positive proclamation, and they are not telling us the real truth. And that's of the present day. Because they are dull of hearing, therefore they heap unto them men having itching ears. But it says, leave these superficial things you are hearing now, and leave the superficial things, the church that is falling, falling away from the Lord before the Lord comes. He says, leave all that and go back to the origin. Go back to the commencement. Remember, therefore, how thou hast heard and how thou hast received. He wants us to remember that. In John chapter 15, verse 20, John chapter 15, reading from verse 20, it says, remember the word that I said unto you. You must always recall, always remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it says we go into all the world, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have said unto you. It's not just the present day messages, the present day utterances, and the present day theologians, what they're saying, remember the word that Christ has spoken. Remember therefore how thou hast received and how thou hast heard. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 5, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading here from verse 5. Remember ye not, don't you remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. It says that is what to remember. And as you bring it to mind, the words you received those days on repentance, the words you received those days on conviction of sin, the words you received those days on total repentance and abandoning the way that is evil, the words you heard those days that the Spirit of God must be a witness in your heart, that you are a child of God before you stop praying, the words you heard those days that you follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord the words you heard those days tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high for ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth remember how you heard remember how you received the word that he spoke unto us and he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He wants us to remember. He wants us to recall the words we heard, how we heard, and how we received. And number five is telling us to hold fast. In Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. Revelation chapter 3, in verse 3, it says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and hold fast, and hold fast. How do you hold fast? You think of your good name, you hold your good name fast, and if anything is going to spoil that name, anything is is going to bring that name to the mud. You say, uh uh, never. You are holding on to that good name that you have. You have any property and you have any profitable thing. You are holding fast to that. You are holding fast to your wife. If anybody wants to come in and take your wife, you are holding fast. Somebody wants to come and snatch your husband from you, you are holding fast. Anything precious to you that you have, the way you hold fast, it says, 
if uh, your wife is precious to you, husband precious to you, if your child is precious to you, if your certificate is precious to you, and you're holding that fast, it says this one is more precious. Your title to heaven. It says this one is more precious. Your assurance of getting to heaven, of being a candidate for the rapture. It says you hold it fast. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 13. It says, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and in love which is in Christ Jesus hold that fast it says in verse 14 in verse 14 that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us it tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 Hebrews chapter 3 and we're reading from verse uh, we're reading from verse 12 Hebrews chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You understand? Departing from the living God cannot happen except you have an evil heart of unbelief. A good heart will not depart from the Lord. A steadfast heart will not depart from the Lord. An heavenly minded heart will not depart from the Lord. You find that some people have departed from the living God and they're not doing things that the living God will not approve of. And they say, I know my heart. My heart is good. My brother, that's not right. That's not true. An evil heart of unbelief is what drives a person to depart from the living God. In verse 13, it says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And you know, if somebody is hardened, it is not that I'm becoming more courageous, that's why I'm hardened. I'm becoming more matured. That's why I'm hardened. I'm becoming more intelligent. That's why I'm hardened. No, not at all. You're misplacing the facts. If you are hardened, my brother, if you are hardened, my sister, it's because of the deceitfulness of sin. But it says in verse 14, in verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. The Lord is giving us the medicine that will kill the disease, that will awaken, that will awaken the spiritually dead. It says, number one, be watchful. Number two, strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Number three, to perfect your works. Number four, to remember how you received and heard and then do the first works again. Number five, to hold fast that good thing that you have. Number six is to repent. That means to return. That means to renew your consecration commitment unto the Lord. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, you art a height, then you fell to a lower level. It says, Remember therefore from where thou art fallen, you are at the height of commitment to the Lord, at the height of consecration to the Lord, at the height of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, at the height of being sensitive to the words of the Spirit of God, but you are no more like that now, you are falling from that level, at the height of life, abundant life, spiritual life, and the vital life, dynamic life in the Lord, but you are falling from that dynamism to a lower level level it says remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent 
and do the false works and renew yourself. It says, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. It tells us in Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I correct and chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Be zealous therefore and repent. Why is he telling us all this? He's telling us so that we'll be ready for his coming. Ready for his coming. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 3, it says we should remember. And as he says, we shall remember how we have received and heard, and we shall hold fast and repent. And if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a seed, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He wants us to do all this, to be watchful, to strengthen the things that remain, to perfect our works, and to remember how we received and to hold fast and to repent, return and renew so that we'll be ready for his coming. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 15. It's still telling us how we ought to know that he's coming again. And he's coming very soon and he will come suddenly when many people are not expecting. Behold, I come as a seed. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and the sea is shame. He wants us to do everything so we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. Revelation chapter 22, we're looking at verse 12. Revelation chapter 22, reading from verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He wants us to be ready. My brother, be ready. My sister, be ready. Boys and girls, let's be ready. The Lord is coming. And when he comes, great will be the joy of those who have made themselves ready, willing, watchful candidates of the rapture. We're coming to point number three now. In point number three, refining and abiding with sanctified, diligent saints. It tells us in chapter three of Revelation, Revelation chapter three, verse four, thou hast a few names even in Sardis. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis. You know, there are people that say it's not my fault. The church is cold, that's why I'm cold. The church is dead, that's why I'm dead. The church is uh, superficial, that's why I'm superficial. The church is not serious, that's why I'm not serious. The church is not watchful, that's why I'm not watchful. Yes, if you know about our pastor, our pastor does not care, he's not challenged, and we have his attitude, that's why we're not challenged to you. It says, you know, even in this studies, a dying church, a dead church, even in this service, thou has a few names. You should not give excuse that your coldness and your lukewarmness and your deadness and your superficiality is because of the condition of the general church. It's because of the last days. It's because of the shepherd. It's because of so and so. That even in studies, thou has a few names. I pray you'll be one of those few in Christendom in Jesus' name. That no matter the attitude of others, no matter the lukewarmness of others, no matter the spiritual deadness of others, you'll be among the few that God will be able to say and Christ will be able to commend you. Thou hast a few names even in studies which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me white for they are worthy. In this section, we're going to look at number one, the purity of sanctified, undefiled saints. 
It says concerning these few in studies. It says concerning these faithful fields that they have not defiled their garments as they were purged, as they were cleansed. They remain purged and cleansed. And when they had the word of God that should purge them and purify them, they quickly went to their knees. They wanted to be their best and the whitest they could be every time. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, looking at verse 1. It says, having therefore these promises dearly beloved it says let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god perfecting holiness in the fear of god there are some people that have historical experiences that is their salvation is historical i god saved they are not doing anything to keep that salvation up to date. I got sanctified. I remember the date I became holy when I consecrated my life to the Lord. They are not perfecting holiness in the fear of God. They are not having, remember what was said about watchfulness, personal watchfulness. They are not having, remember what was said, prioritize watchfulness. They are not watching and they are not having perpetual watchfulness. He wants us to be perpetual about it, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That what we have heard, we keep even until this time and we keep perpetually every day. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What did he give himself for the church? In verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Let the word of God always act as washing agent in your life. To cleanse and to wash by the washing of water by the word. And then in verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is our responsibility. You always get on your knees on your face before the Lord and allow the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse and to wash you and to keep you perpetually holy, righteous, sanctified, so that it will say you are one of those people in the church, one of those few who will walk with him in white because you remain undefiled without blemish. Number two, he gives a pledge. He tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. It says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. There's a pledge he gave. There's a promise he gave. He that overcometh, the same, only those who have overcome, shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. When we are born again, our names are written in the book of life in heaven. That's what Christ said in Luke chapter 10 verse 20. In Luke chapter 10 verse 20 it says... Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. As long as we keep to that conversion, to that consecration, and we abide with the Lord all the time, we're committed to the Lord. Our names that have been written in heaven will remain in the book of life. It says, as long as we are overcoming, 
he that overcometh will be clothed with straw white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book which I have written, and I will confess his name before my Father who is in heaven. Remain a conqueror, remain an overcomer, remain triumphant, and your name will remain in the book of life. What if somebody goes back into sinning? And he continues in that scene. Let's look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're looking at verse 32. Yet now Moses was praying to God concerning the children of Israel, concerning Aaron and the elders of Israel and the people of Israel. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he didn't complete that sentence. He said, if you will forgive their sin, well and good. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. God has a principle. God has a practice. He doesn't just uh, do anything just because Moses is saying, get my name out of your book. Or just because anybody is saying, take away the names out of the book of life. He has a principle and he knows what he does and how he does what he does. Look at verse 33. Here is the answer of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. When somebody backslides and he goes straight into sin, fully into sin, completely into sin, and he abandons the word of God, abandons the character of the believer, abandons Christ the Savior, and is now given to sin and to the devil and to the world. Whosoever have sinned against me, it will I blot out of my book. But if you rush back to the Lord, if you come back to the Lord, if you repent before the Lord again, if you say you are sincerely sorry, you are deeply sorry, and your heart is contrite before the Lord, and you confess and you forsake, and the blood of Jesus washes you whiter than snow again, then your name will be the book of life. And Jesus said, if you are one of those faithful few that will abide in Christ, abide in the Lord, abide in that salvation, abide in the holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, I will not blot out his name out of the book that I have written. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Look at the promise he has given us. Now, number three, the promise for spotless unwavering saints. We're looking at Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three, we're looking at verse five. He that overcometh always, always in the first century, that's who the promise belonged to. He that overcometh in the 21st century, that's who the promise belongs to he that overcometh in the first generation of believers those are the people that have the promise he that overcometh in this generation of uh, believers he that overcometh those are the people that always have this pledge and this promise of the Lord. They overcome the flesh. They overcome the devil. They overcome the demons. They overcome all the waves of the world wanting to beat against their life and wanting to swallow them up. They overcome. They overcome in persecution. They overcome in tribulation. They overcome in all their trials. They overcome in all the temptations of the devil trying to pull them back, draw them back and bring them down into sin again. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants me to be an overcomer. He wants you to remain spotless. He wants you to remain unblameable. He wants you to remain unwavering. He wants you to remain a saint 
change in the Lord. These are the people that are going to have the opportunity and the liberty and the privilege of entering into the kingdom of God, of going with the Lord on the final day. He wants us to continue consistently to be with the Lord. He tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, 2 Peter chapter 3, we're looking in at verse 13. It's reminding us of the people that will have the promise and the people that will have the pledge. It says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That she may be found of him without spot or blameless. It tells us in Jude chapter 1 verse 23 and verse 24. Jude chapter 1 verse 23. It says, and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire as you're witnessing. Don't get involved with the morality of the people you're witnessing to as you're preaching. Don't get involved with the defilement of the people you're witnessing to as you're doing the work of the Lord, as you're falling up on backsliders. Don't follow and don't get involved with the, the, with the draws and the drag and the dung and the evil things those backsliders have. You save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And now in verse 24, in verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. God is able is able to keep you. You might be in Sardis, God is able to keep you. You might be in Tatira even, God is able to keep you. You might be in Pagamos, God is able to keep you. You might be in the most defiled city and the most defiled society on earth or in your country or in your local government. He is able to keep you now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We're coming back to that verse 24, but I want you to look at verse 21. God is able to keep. We're looking at Jude chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 21. In verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God. You see, you cannot say, well, God has not kept me and uh, God has not fulfilled his promise. I would have been kept. I would have remained. You know, there is the part you have to play. And you don't put everything in the hand of God himself has commanded you. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You cannot put everything on your pastor, on your shepherd, on the bishop. You cannot put everything on the, on the angel of the church in service. It's because he has not done this. You have a Bible to read. You have a church to come to. And then you have the word of God that is coming to us. It's there on the net. It's there on the YouTube. It's there on Deeper Life Radio. It's there everywhere. If you really want to be kept, the word of God is there. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And now as you do your part, it tells us in verse 24, it says, if you're willing to be kept, God is able now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Look at verse 25. It says in verse 25, unto him, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And everybody said, Amen. 
in your life, he'll be glorified. In your family, he'll be glorified. As you wake up, as you are revived, as you get away from the spiritual slumber and the spiritual sleep, and you allow the word of God uh, to be dynamite in you, and you rise up in the arms of faith, or you kneel down with real confidence before the Lord, and everything that needs to be done, you want to do everything, you want to watch and then you want to remember the word of God and you want to strengthen yourself in any area where you are where you are falling or you have gone back and then you are returning fully with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and as you give yourself fully to the Lord and then you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord and you are getting prepared he'll be glorified in your life to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever and amen in your life and amen in your spiritual life and amen as it quickens you and it wakens you he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches what the spirit says unto every member of the church let's rise up now and speak to the lord in prayer Let's rise up and say, Lord, I've heard your word. I want to be awake and I want to have the strength of the Lord. I don't want to keep on sleeping. I don't want to be dead. I don't even want to be dying. I want to be dynamic. I want to be alive. I want to have the life of Christ in me. He has spoken to you. Rise up and speak to the Lord. Examine your spiritual life. Examine how you are. Examine how you are living. Examine if the Spirit of God is still active and alive in you. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right? Is telling you that he has the seven spirits of God. He's telling you that he has the seven stars. He says, I know your works and I know you have a name that you live. But are you really alive? I know you have a name that you live. Are you really having eternal life? I know that you have a name that you live. Are you having that spiritual life? Or is he saying, but thou art dead? Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I want to remain alive. Alive in Christ, alive with the Spirit of God, alive with the consciousness that I am in Christ, alive with the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. I receive Jesus who is life and his life abides in me. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord that you want to keep that life. You want to keep that life because that life abides in you, the life of Christ. The life of the Spirit, the life that comes out of the world. You rise up from the dead and you wake up and you arise and then the Spirit of God keeps you really alive. And he has given us what you do. You find yourself slumbering. You find yourself sleeping. You find yourself idle. You find yourself dying off, dying out. You find yourself not as quickened as you ought to be. And it appears a kind of sin, a kind of iniquity, a kind of trespass is taking hold of your life. Come to the Lord and do the first works again. And repent with all your heart. And let him come in because he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, open the door of your heart unto the Lord. Open the door of your heart to the spirit of life that will quicken you and make you alive and dynamic in Christ. It says, if anyone opens the door, I will come in and I will sup with him. I'll fellowship with him and he weighs me as many as I love. I rebuke and chase it. Repent ye therefore, be zealous therefore, and repent. I know what he has told us to do. The specific that he gave us, that to be watchful. Don't be careless, be watchful. Personal watchfulness. Before you watch over other people, personal watchfulness prioritized watchfulness 
that there is this watchfulness in your life that personally in a prioritized way you watch over the important thing when christ comes what will he be looking for that's what to watch over don't watch over things you are not going to take to heaven while you miss the things that will qualify you for heaven prioritize your watchfulness perpetual watchfulness and strengthen the things that remain strengthen the things that remain they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength wait upon the lord wait upon the lord and you renew your strength while others are fainting while others are dying out while others are dying up if you will wait on the lord he'll quicken you he'll revive you he'll put that spirit of life in you and that spirit of life will set you free from the law of sin and death as the lord called abram and he said walk before me and be thou perfect the same thing is telling you any area of imperfection in your christian life in your ministry in your profession are you excusing imperfection are you accusing god because it's demanding perfection walk before me and be thou perfect are you giving excuse the place around me the people around me this is who they are this is what they are what does that mean therefore you cannot be perfect it says perfect your works and then it says remember when you came to the lord how you came to the lord and remember the fervency you had at that time remember the commitment consecration you had at that time remember the devotedness devotion you had at that time remember how you stood firm even when you had to stand alone at that time remember how you received and heard and hold fast hold fast your commitment to the lord don't allow anyone to take this away from you and repent and return and renew renew your heart renew your commitment renew your life before the lord do everything it takes to make yourself ready for the coming of the lord and remember it is a purity the purity of sanctified undefiled saints saints undefiled saints unblameable saints spotless saints washed in the blood of the lamb the blood is still available the blood of jesus still available it will cleanse it will purge you'll purify perfecting holiness in the fear of god that's what he wants done spend time give attention perfecting holiness in the fear of god is able to do it in fact he died for us on the cross so that he'll sanctify us and he'll make us spotless without spot without wrinkle without the signs of the old man he'll make us what we ought to be and then he grants us a pledge he wants us to hold fast hold firm steadfast on pretending as saints on wavering as the saints of god make sure that your name remains in the book of life don't let the devil deceive you don't let the devil make you do anything that will provoke the almighty god that god will say i cannot have such a criminal in the book of life let your name remain in the book of life as you abide 
in the grace of God. And then the promise will be yours. Your walk with him in white because you are worthy. And he will confess your name before the Father and before his angels. He that has an ear, attentive ear, he that has an ear, obedient ear, he that has an ear, circumcised ear, he that has an ear, a responsive ear, he that has an ear, he wants us to have the ear that is open, a listening ear. He that has an ear, he wants us to have an ear that is attending to the watch of the Lord. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We have ears to hear. Write indelibly what you have spoken to us on every heart. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. In love, you have spoken to us. And we pray, Lord, all the promises of the Lord will be ours in Jesus' name. Cleanse everyone, awaken everyone, strengthen everyone, energize everyone, put us on our feet and make us watchful, make us ready for the coming of our Lord in Jesus' name. At every cross of the road and every challenge of life, make us watchful, make us sober, make us vigilant, make us ready. So that when the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ, those who have died remaining in Christ, they will rise up. And we which are alive, alive in Christ, will be caught up together with them. None of us will be missing. In Jesus' name, make every brother, every sister, make every young person, every older person, make everyone ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. Confirm your word in every life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the church said, Amen.